You're listening to the Cycling Podcast Femina, brought to you by iWalker. Flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWalker. If you run a business, find out more at iwalker.co.uk. That's i w o c a.co.uk. Well, hello and welcome to the March episode of the Cycling Podcast Femina, or is it the IT crowd? We'd be rechristened. If listeners could see behind the scenes what's been going on tonight in setting up for this remote recording. We're the opposite of the, the IT crowd. We don't know how to do anything. The, the non-IT crowd. <laughs> oh my word. They're still struggling to work iPhones crowd. That's Orla Shinoui and uh, she is in one corner of my screen and Rose Manley is in the other one. Hello, Rose and Orla. Hello. Hello, hello. I got the nicest corner. Thank you. I'm Richard Moore. And well, uh, a strange episode, a strange time, isn't it, for cycling and everything else. But we've got quite a lot of racing in this month's episode and we're going to make the most of it because we don't know when there will be more racing um, I was at Newsblad recently and we'll get some uh, some interviews and action from there. And we will talk quite a lot, though, about the coronavirus and how it is affecting uh, the cycling calendar and, and, you know, forcing us all to put everything on hold for a bit, apart from the cycling podcast Femina, which will carry on as usual. Hurrah! Probably fighting off millions of other podcasts that start as a result of being isolated Everyone being stuck in their own homes for too long. Remember the original and best, folks. Do you think podca- podcasting will be a, a boom industry in this period, Rose? Oh, yeah. There'll be a podcast about everything. All kinds of social media, I think. Yeah, you can see it already, all the content of people just being bored in their homes, which, which I have um, bravely contributed to. So I'll, I'll not criticise. You're in Amsterdam, Orla, so I think you're you're on day two of, of lockdown. And, and Rose asked you earlier on, when we were before we started recording, how you were finding it. And you said, well, it was okay at first, um, but... We, you are literally 48 hours in. Not even, not sorry, even. Sorry it started on Monday you. morning and this is Tuesday night. So uh, yeah, not even two full days in yet. And I'm going slowly a little bit to stir crazy right now. But anyway, anyway, this is your refuge, people. This is mm, your safe is. corner of the world where all is as was and as will be. Having said that, later in the episode, we will hear uh, an interview with Martina Alzini, the Italian writer on Big Lecca. Tusha, a member of the Italian Olympic track squad um, who has been living in this lockdown situation in Italy. Life has been been strange for her and her fellow Italians. And I mean, she spoke very uh, movingly, I thought, about what, what that's been like, what it's been like to train and, and live uh, in that situation. So we will hear from her later in the episode. But uh, I mentioned there has been a lot of racing. Orla, have you got a news roundup for us? Yeah, I do. You remember a quaint time when we had actual racing to enjoy? Um, well, you might think it's all gone, but no, the Cycling Podcast Femina is the last reserve of actual race results for now. We've had a lot since the last episode, actually, haven't we? Um, so let me take you back in time. Uh, we had the inaugural Dubai Women's Tour won by Lucy van der Haar of High Tech Products, Burke Sport, formerly Lucy Garner, of course, and the British rider. She also took a stage along the way. That was her first stage win since 2015 at a race. Um, Anna van der Breggen won the Setmana Cyclista Valenciana. She also took a stage along the way to that. Um, Annemiek van Vluten took her first win of the season and her first in the rainbow bands at Omloop Het Newsblad with a typical solo attack. She finished 42 seconds ahead of Marta Bastianelli and Florence Mackay with Chantal Vandenbroek Black on the same time in fourth. Um, I think you both watched that, didn't you? It was a brilliant battle um, for second to fourth after that unsuccessful chase for van Vluten. Brilliant finish. Um, Lorena Vibus won Omloop Van Het Hageland, showing the recent fuss with her Park Hotel Valkenberg team hasn't distracted her from the task in hand. I don't know if you noticed, though, I spotted she inconveniently didn't have enough time to zip up her jersey and show off the team branding and all its glory as she crossed the line. That was a bit... <laughs> 
bit of a shame. What are you trying to suggest, um, Mart- Dola? Oh, no, absolutely <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing. I just think it's a, it's a wee shame, shall we say, when she doesn't have long left in the team. Um, Marta Bastianelli was again beaten into second at Hacheland. Chantal Vandenbroek Black then did an Anamique and won Lusamine de Dam with a 50 kilometre solo attack to take her third win at that race in six years. And then Strada Bianca was. Should we say that? Should we really say that that is a Anamik when Blark has won it so many times? Really, Chantal Blark was just doing a Chantal Blark. I meant more surely. in terms of the 50k long range attack. Going yeah, solo. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But absolutely. That's true, actually. Vandenberg Black was the By the time I Black. saw the uh, live footage, Chantal Black was already way ahead, and basic, and that, and then that was it, wasn't it? And doing what she no, didn't often get to manage does. to see any of the fighting for position or anything. Yeah, it was remarkable, really remarkable attack. And then Strada Bianca was supposed to be the second women's world tier race of this season, but ended up being the first one to be cancelled. And of course, we've seen every race since follow suit, which takes us into this current current period of limbo. The UCI have officially suspended racing until the 3rd of April but of course racing at the end of that month has also been postponed with both Flesh Wallon and Liège Baston Liège which was supposed to be in the 22nd and the 26th of April also postponed and men's racing postponed beyond that um, in other news, the French writer Marion Sico has admitted to using EPO after testing positive at the French Time Trial Championships in June of last year. She had initially claimed, if you remember, that women have exceptionally high levels of EPO when they're menstruating. Um, but she's now admitted to Googling how to buy the drug, buying it from China and injecting it. But uh, in an interview, which I'm sure many of you will have noticed with Stade she claimed she only went down this route after months of psychological abuse from the Dolcini Van Eyck team director, Mark Brack. Um, Stade published messages allegedly between the two in which Brack is said to have asked Yuko to send him regular bikini pictures, apparently to keep a check on her weight, but to keep the practice a secret. Um, the Belgian registered team is being investigated by the UCI after allegations from other riders and have since released um, quite a startling press statement accusing Seiko specifically of trying to take advantage of the Me Too movement in relation to her confessed doping. And that's your News Roundup for March. You are listening to the Cycling Podcast Femina, Brought to you by iWalker. Flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWalker. If you run a business, find out more at iwalker.co.uk. That's iwoca.co.uk. Well, thanks very much to our new title sponsor, Iwaka. Um, and they've come in since the, the last Cycling Podcast Femina, and we're very grateful to them for their support. They are fans of cycling, and they do listen to the podcast. Uh, that's how this came about, because they got in touch after hearing we were looking out for a new title sponsor. And here we are. Um, a little bit about Iwaka. They lend money to small businesses to keep the wheels turning. And uh, they were founded in 2012 and they've made finance available to more than 50,000 businesses across Europe. They can lend between 1,000 and 250,000 pounds and make it quick and easy to get a decision. Among the businesses they've lent to are bike shops and cafes, spin studios, hair salons, building companies and pretty much any other kind of business. Over the coming months on the Cycling Podcast Femina, we'll hear more about Iwaka and in particular their involvement in cycling because it's not just a cycling podcast they're supporting. There are other initiatives to races and a cycling club, the Kendall Cycle Club. Uh, we are certainly very grateful to them for their support over the this coming year. And, uh, well, normally I'd say it allows us to go and cover races, but um, it's going to allow us to certainly produce lots of podcasts so don't worry about that and we've got some some plans that we're developing about how we cover the sport of cycling in this hiatus um, but we fortunately this might be worth letting us know about that Richard actually. oh yeah don't worry they're, 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 anything about them. no no don't worry <laughs> they're being developed no, I'm, I'm glad you said that Richard because I've got some ideas as well maybe we could share them oh yeah no, no, don't worry. <laughs> I, I was referring more to the uh, plans that we have i.e. the cycling the, cy- the other cycling podcast to to cover the Giro um, that's the specific plan that we've been working on but we will come up with plans for the cycling podcast Femina between us won't we 
Yeah. Well, we've um, got yes. um, some really interesting interviews lined up already for next month. We so do. there are plenty we of do. stories still to be told. We do, Orla. That's absolutely right. But there has been racing. So let's make the most of that, shall we? I thought we mm, could each yes. pick out a, a moment from the, the racing that we've had that, uh, you know, has produced a talking point or got us excited or interested or intrigued. Orla, what's your moment? Mine was Annemiek van Vluten's win at Newsblad, partly because we could watch it for the first time and wasn't that wonderful. I was actually on a family day out at the time. We were at a science museum in Amsterdam, but I was able to have it on my phone watching as we went around until somebody said, do you realise your telephone's on? I was like, well, yes, because I'm obviously watching the cycling. Anyway, um, it was just the way that she won it. She just makes it look so easy, but it, it just, it was a real delivery and all of that hard work over the winter and I loved seeing her doing it in fairly typical style with the rainbow bands for the first time and it's made me think the reason I'm picking her out in particular is that it's made me think that with everything that's happening at the moment the riders and the teams who'll be best placed to come back from all of this and sort of hit the ground running will be the most disciplined, will be the ones who are still prioritising their racing fitness regardless of when the next race is going to be um, and training as hard as if there was no uncertainty. And you've got to suspect that Annemiek van Vluten will be that very rider. So at the moment, we are being told that the Olympics will still be going ahead. That will still be her focus. And I think it'll be really exciting to watch how she comes back after all of this because adversity is a true test of a champion, isn't it? So, yeah, Annemiek's win and the way she did it and having the rainbow bands and being able to watch it at the Science Museum. They were all my moments. Great to see her Great <laughs> to see her win in the, in the black gilet of world champion. Oh, uh, stop. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, stop. Sorry. Uh, the narrowing of the eyes there, Orla. <laughs> <laughs> um, have they not? Has Annemiek van Vooten not gone off bike packing? Did I not read? Um, Anna van der Breggen has. Yep, van Bos has. Oh, Anna van der Breggen. Sorry, I yeah. thought it was Annemiek van Vooten. Oh, Vluten. Richard, come on. Anna van der Breggen, yep, van der Bos. And Chantal. Amy Peters. Was it Amy Peters? Amy Peters. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm this hoping is terrible. To, I'm hoping to cat. <laughs> the, well, the only one I know for sure is Yip because I have been in touch with her and she's definitely been off bikepacking and I'm hoping to chat to her um, for the next podcast. They're actually coming back today. I don't know how long they were planning to go for, um, but they have only been gone a couple of days, but I think they've been told to come back because of oh, any threatened lockdown, which is a bit of a shame, but, you know, at least they got out. It'd be interesting to hear what their plans had been and um, what they got up to. That's, that's whoever another they chat. Are. <laughs> whatever, whatever they were doing, whoever, whoever they, they are. Whoever they are, wherever <laughs> they are, whatever they've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> could you do some virtual bike packing on Zwift or something? I'm quite there, sure that's know, being developed you... as we speak. Kind Great. of defeats well, the purpose of the adventure, but yeah. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, my moment uh, was probably Lorena Vibus winning uh, Omluk H- H- Hageland because um, I'd been watching her the day before at Het Newsblad. We'll hear a little bit about that actually in the package from Het Newsblad that we've got coming up, but you know the 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 body language and just observing her and her her team after the wrangles over the winter about whether she would stay with that team Park Hotel Valkenburg or not. You know you, you would have thought a rider so young, so talented, but still so young, uh, might have been very distracted by that, and it might have really played havoc with her winter training. But clearly, um, no. I mean, she looked good in Het Newsblad, actually. She, I thought I thought she was a real danger in that race and then obviously won the next day. And um, at the finish of Het Newsblad, I spoke to her team manager, Park Hotel Valkenburg, Esme Trump, um, just to find out about the state of relations between Lorena Vibus and the team. How is she doing? Because this was her first race of the year, I think. Um, obviously uncertainty over the, the, the winter about her future. I spoke to you about that. Um, but has that affected her? Or, you know, she's obviously going quite well. Has, is, has she been able to be focused fully on, on being a rider? We did a really good training camp uh, two weeks ago in uh, in Altea in Spain, and um, that was really good also for the team to have her uh, in the in the group again. And uh, I think uh, she had a good winter. She's in shape, um, but today was just. Uh, yeah, just a little bit too much. Is she is she happy though? I mean, are are things kind of resolved between you for her to 
focus on the races over the next few months yeah we have a good uh, good relationship and everything uh, is okay now and um, yeah um, we can uh, can speak to each other and uh, and have a good day so no problem so that was Esme Trump um, from Park Hotel Valkenburg and Rose what about you what was your moment of uh, the early season or what may actually turn out the to be season. the season yes <laughs> the whole season um, well I have to say I thought Lottie Kopecky's performance at La Samin was quite a revelation I mean she we all you know as Orla said in the news roundup Chantal Block went off with the win um, something like oh, I don't know how many kilometres it was from the end but a long way from the end 50 but, uh, for 50 for Lottie Kopecky, Kopecky to come in on third and that was about a day after she'd finished at the World Championships, she'd actually missed out by the tiniest of margins on getting Olympic uh, qualification um, in the team pursuit for Belgium. Um, and to come back almost immediately, be in the breakaway in La Samin and, and take third, I was thought that was really impressive because I think uh, people have been expecting a lot from Lottie Kopecky for years as a Belgian rider. And obviously there's such a great tradition especially in the men's side of the uh, the sport in Belgium and uh, people have always put a lot of pressure on Kopecky and uh, Jolien Dor to kind of perform um, so it was kind of great to see her get an extraordinary result you know amongst a packed field uh, at La Samin and I, I would have said had there been other races uh, you know that shows a lot of promise but uh yeah i can't say that so you know it, that but it was a, a great result um in of itself shoot uh, shoot at du peloton cycling podcast team car the back of the pack please that's the voice of Seb PK reminding me to tell you that this month's episode of cycling podcast femina is supported by stitch fix now stitch fix is the online styling service. Really easy. Go to their website, fill out a style quiz about your clothing preferences, shape, sizes, and what you like to wear. And then it's over to your stylist who will hand select and send you five items of clothing and accessories, um, along with a lovely card, including outfit inspiration and style tips. You try everything on at home, keep and pay what you like, and send back the rest. The postage is free, um, and you can leave feedback on what your stylist sent you and request a different stylist the next time, or keep the same one. There are over 100 brands available, some well-known, some not so well-known. Um, and the best bit is that you pay just £10 for your stylist time, which is redeemable against anything you keep. Delivery and returns always free and you don't need to subscribe to anything. You can arrange regular deliveries if you like or you can just order when you want to. And Rose, you have done it. You've done Stitch Fix. How did you find that experience? I have. I have been Stitch Fixed. And uh, I have to say, is I mean, what a dream to, you know, if you're, well, it's not a dream to be stuck in uh, your house all the time, but to have a personal stylist send you beautiful clothes from wonderful designs that you've you may know or you don't know is that's I mean that's pretty good isn't it that is pretty amazing but yeah I, I got some great clothes last time and you kept a couple of items I believe Rose would you like to tell us what they are yes I did as you said you get sent five and I kept uh two of them um one of them is like a black mesh um long sleeve top with like these um furry balls furry polka dots <laughs> i've seen this haven't oh, yeah. i absolutely it is not it, it's this, this is the delivery you got when i was there it was really nice yeah really nice yeah 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 that was yeah that's lovely and i and also um some black and white pleated um three-quarter lengths um which I wore a lot in when I when went to Colombia last month, uh, wore them an awful lot, which was, yeah, wonderful. So some great uh, items and to get clothes that you wouldn't pick for yourself necessarily and look great and you love. That's, yeah, brilliant. It is quite exciting when the when the box arrives, I must admit. I'm a regular customer. So this is a, a Stitch Fix top that I'm wearing. You might not be able to see it properly, but... Well, take it from me, take my take my word, it's really good. Um, get started with Stitch Fix today and support the Cycling Podcast Femina by going to stitchfix.co.uk forward slash cycling right now. That's S-T-I-T-C-H-F-I-X dot co dot UK forward slash cycling. Well, as I mentioned, I was at Het Newsblad and I spent the day in the Drops team car, something that both of you have done before Orla and Rose for the Cycling Podcast Femina. I, I don't think I 
been in a team car before with Bob Varney, who runs the team. Um, quite a lot of new riders on that team this year. They've picked up a few of the Virtue Cycling uh, riders. Um, that team folded, of course. And also in the car was Julian Wynn, who is a you know he's got a very distinguished record as a, a rider. First of all, a former British champion, he rode the Giro d'Italia. And has also worked with the women's team at, the, at British Cycling and with other women's teams as well. But he was very involved in the British women's team when Nicole Cook won the Olympic gold medal in Beijing in 2008. He really sort of managed that group and coached that group. And, um, you know, he's been very involved in women's cycling at the highest level for quite a long time now. So he was in the back uh, working sort of on a freelance basis for that team at the moment. Um, let's hear f- from my day with... Bob Varney and Julian Wynn in the Drops team car at Het Newsblad. Here we are. Well, the race is underway, Bob. What do you expect to happen today? <laughs> Come on, prediction time. Uh, I think the race will be won by a lone rider, uh, alone on their own. Uh, in Nino's in drops kit. Uh, it would be nice, but I think one has to be realistic. If we can make the... Uh, if we can make the nearly group, I think that would be good. The group that's there or thereabouts. Julian, who's going to win? What's your, what's your, what's your prediction? Uh, I think it'll be 15, 20 coming into the finish. Who, who, who will win? Uh, I think it'll be a sprinter. Marta Bastianelli? Yeah, I'll, I'll actually, I'll go for Marta Bastianelli, yeah, yeah. Or or Van Dyke on a long one in the last 5k. He's hedging his bets now, he's giving yeah, you two Well, options. I'm a bit more definitive than you though, Bob. I said fair. it would be won by a lonely rider. I didn't hear any names. Okay, I think Ellen Van Dyke. I think someone will get away on their own and it won't be uh, Marta uh, Bastianelli. Um, or any of the sprinters but it's quite a difficult race to predict if you look back two years ago Christina Sigard won mm. you know lovely lovely person nice solid rider but not one of the top riders in the sport mm. she got popped and she came back and she won so that gives everybody hope you know but it's, I think it's quite a difficult race to predict mm. who do you think Richard's going to win? I mean I think Bassinelli is a good Shout. I'm intrigued by Lorena Vibus to mm. see because again if it's a group that size she could be there um, it, I was studying her body language on the on the pres- podium presentation yeah. um, and you know she wears the Dutch champions jersey so she's she already looks different to the rest Televisie of the team and, and she had a hat on and she was sort of standing slightly apart from them so yeah. you know she doesn't want to be on that team no. um, it's her first race of the season uh, and I'm really curious to see because she's certainly got the ability to win today hasn't yeah, she but, well she's one of the she's probably the fastest but the winter based on last year yeah you know I mean? and the stress the winter must have taken yeah. a toll on her yeah. if it's a group Con Rivera of course maybe could be there Sarah Roy short list is getting longer I need to get some clothes. Okay, no worries. On my way. I'm still in front, two, and the gap is 30 seconds. 30 seconds to the lone leader, 3-0, 30 Pretty seconds. Cool. Man who did it last year. <laughs> Looking through the start, there's quite a few of your your ex-riders. Do you, do you like seeing them? You know, Alice Barnes, um, Abby May, Parkinson, obviously, Eva Berman as well at Bulls Dome. Do you enjoy seeing how they're getting on? Yeah, your very al- much alumni. So, yeah. yeah, Eva's in our hotel. She always comes over, gives me a big hug and has a chat. So it's, no, it's good. Alice always keeps in touch. Um, Abby May Parkinson out in our hotel so. yeah very proud of all of them Abby Van Twisk at Trek Sega Fredo not racing today but so we develop some good riders but also staff you know a lot of our staff have gone on to bigger and better more well paid things you know. I guess that's a measure though of uh, 
development team, which is kind of what you are in a way. Um, you know, to to provide a stepping stone. I know you want to win races as well, but yeah. part of your remit is you've got a lot of young riders. You always always had a lot of young riders on the team, so part of the remit, I guess, is to develop them. And the sign of success is to see them sprinkled around the field in a race like this. Yeah, absolutely. No, kind of. We are. We're a development team, and we're proud of it. You know, and until we get a more substantial budget where we can then, you know, reward our riders. <laughs> Uh, well, we better the then that's the way it's going to be so it's, it's it's no good kind of um, being anything other than proud of that that's what we do you know? we like to think we do it quite well so um, as you say that's uh, proof of the pudding is uh, you know how far your riders go on Alice Barnes world champion Eva Berman you know Bols Dolmes Abby Van Twist Trek Sega Fredo yeah you're a rider down actually in this race aren't you um but so you've got a spare a spare place. If you could have one rider, um, if you could sign one rider um, from another team, who would it be? Money was no object. Okay, so let me tell you a secret, shall I? Mm. Like a secret? Yeah. So end of 2018, we had four riders signed uh, before our uh, co-title sponsor pulled out at the very death, and we released them all. One of those was Demi Vollering, who then subsequently left and signed for Park Hotels, went on to great things. So that would have been a nice one mm. to have kept. But would she have developed, you know, in the same way? I don't know, but she's always friendly, always chats. Uh, I think if I could sign any rider back, I would probably take Eva Berman back as a leader because I think she's massively talented. I think she works for others uh, pretty much all the time at Bowles. Uh, she's a great influence on the group. Uh, she was really good with Abby May in the, uh, Flanders two years ago. Um, so she lifts the level of the group around her. She's a real team player, and I think she'd be an excellent leader. Um, we had a, obviously, she was leader for the women's tour, had a couple of, I don't think he was ever outside the top 10 and, you know 7th on GC so yeah I think you're putting me on the spot a bit but I think I would probably take Eva Eva Berman come on Finja 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 come on go on go go on Finja come on that's your ticket to the finish come on in that group well done Finja Well, we're what? 80 kilometers into the race. What's that car in front, Bob? Uh, what car is that? It's, it's absolute carnage. Uh, two Trek Sega Fader riders down. Two Bulls Dolmans riders went down earlier on. That's Audrey Cordon. Audrey Cordon Rogoas crashed yeah, again. Um, and we saw Annemiek Van Vluten on the deck as well, but she got back up and back in to the front of the race very quickly indeed. Uh, but Little groups split all over the place. We think there's a front group of about 17. You were saying, Bob, that's it's how it should be. I mean, the weather's wild. It's been raining. It's strong wind. Uh, Conditions are pretty horrible, and the race has split as we as we kind of yeah, expect. Uh, how, how are your uh, riders uh, going on? So we still have two in front of us, so we're quite cool with that. So that's Sarah Penton and. Marilyn Van Gielhoff, who are our kind of big hopes for today. So, but yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. It's Belgium. It's February. You know, it's a proper bike race, isn't it? A few surprises. Leah Thomas was uh, out at the back. A big Katusha rider who had been going very well in, yeah, in the south of Spain. Does the riders sometimes get caught out? You know, coming from warm training camps into this well that had been at training camp uh, down near Denia and she won stage four of Valencia last week looked really strong um, so that was a big surprise you'd think that she's probably not 100% perhaps a bit sick um, 
But yeah, that was a bit of a surprise, wasn't it? Good to see Lizzie Banks of the Cycling Podcast up in that front group. Yeah, yeah, well, she's strong. She likes bad weather and she likes uh, tough races, attritional races. So no surprise there. Either. So approaching the moor, we've got that 21 group ahead, a 21 rider group ahead. 30 seconds ahead of a chasing group of 11. Um, unfortunately, Bob, you don't have any riders in that chasing group. No, it would have been good if we did, that's what we were hoping for, but we haven't at the moment, so I think we've got two in the group just behind that, but there'll be obviously going to be a bit of a sort out now, and we'll see exactly where everyone is at the top of this one. Well, Annemiek van Vluten is on the front, driving pretty hard, and she hasn't really attacked, she's just challenging people to... To, to go with her here and She'll not many can wheel, she? yeah I mean there are five Bulls Dolmans riders in that group but this isn't really tactics here is it it's, this is just well, I think it's brute her strength tactics, isn't it she's just she's one of the strongest and this is the most difficult climb in the race and it's the where she wants to make a difference and she's just going to see if she can split the group down to two or three of the strongest and isolate Bulls Dolmans but I mean we'll see Julian the only British champion to ride the Giro. The only man to wear the British champion's jersey in the Giro. Is this correct? Well, according to Bob, I think, but I don't, I'm not too sure. I, I, I'm, it's quite possibly, but I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't, don't want you to quote me on it. But, yeah. Or put it on your wicked beat. That's not what you said in a bar in yeah, Canberra like 10 yeah, days ago. Yeah, if I it, think I might be, you know. If any former British champions who, who rode the Giro are listening, do get in touch. Uh, put us right on that. Yeah, that's my one claim to fame. Uh, but, Julian, are you... are you? Um, I mean, you worked for British Cycling for many years uh, and you're, you're kind of freelancing now. Are you coaching as well? I do have a couple of people I coach. Anyone we know? I can't say. Prime secret coaching? Yeah, yeah. Do they know? Yeah, anyone who's in the front group, I probably coach. <laughs> so I can't say any nationality. Uh, but um, do you do you prefer working in women's cycling? Because you have worked a lot in women's cycling over the last few years. Yes, hundred percent. Much prefer to work with the women. Yeah. Why, why is that? I just find it more exciting, and I, th I also like you know trying to bring the British the British girls girls through as well. You know, um, I find it more motivating to be quite honest. Men's men's racing has got more resources, and I'd like you know like to be part of trying to bring women's racing more up to speed. I guess I don't know really. I I'm not too sure. I'd answer that. I just prefer working at the women's. You know, yeah. I don't think it's and there's lots of prima donnas with the men's. You know, so well. That's what I found anyway. Mm. Doesn't mean I don't like working with the men, but I would prefer to work with the women, for sure. There's a good contract on is the there, angels, Yeah, right? is there more, it's sometimes more mar margin for improvement as well, because, you know, we're watching this race, Lizzie Banks is in that chasing group. You know, she's she's come to cycling quite late and is 29 now, I think, but you can see that she's Im still improving all the time. Well, I think, like, historically, you know, the, you know, the women do, yeah, I just think they have longer careers, you know, and you know, there's, there's, there's very good, I mean, Howard Van Vluten, she's like, what, 37 is she? Seven, I think. Yeah, something like that, you know. I know she's quite unique, but I mean, you know. Embarrassingly, uh, in our predictions, none of us even mentioned Annemiek Van Vluten. I guess that would have been a real shot in the dark, wouldn't it? Suggesting Annemiek Van Vluten. Oh, I think I said there'd be a lone winner on their own. I didn't, didn't want didn't, to play all my cards because you guys had three or four guesses each. You didn't give away the identity of said. And it's boring winner. saying Van Vluten, really, isn't it? Okay. You know, she rides. She rides one dimensionally. She just burns everybody off. <laughs> you can, you know, you're just waiting for her to do it. You know. Um, so not waiting very long in uh, Harrogate. Um, no, yeah, yeah exactly. World Championships. I mean, yeah, she, yeah, she's phenomenal. Yes, uh, it's yes. not over the race. I, know. I mean. 
quite a strong chasing group behind. Yeah, yeah. Last time we saw it on the screen, they were working quite well together, but the gap was staying at 15 seconds, so. Uh, yeah, we're just okay, saying. Right off. So, guys, we're just driving out of Ghent here, and uh, predictions, please, guys. Uh, I think Van Vluten's going to be too strong for everybody. She'll probably flex her muscles on the most difficult climb, which is the Muir over the Capel Muir. She's going to probably have 10 or 15 seconds over the top, and then just time trial away. She is the former world champion time trialist, so, you know, why not? Spot on, Bob. I think, yeah, he's spot on with that assessment, Bob. To be quite honest, I think he, he shows he knows his shit. <laughs> well, um, yeah, great predictions, guys. Just as Van Vluten comes into the finish here, she is um, unzipping her gilet finally, show her rainbow jersey. I think Marta Bastianelli, who really was a tip of ours at the start of the day, my yours, my tip. our tip. My tip. She she looks like she's clipped off uh, from that chasing group. Um, so she is obviously starting the season well as well, but Van Vluten, business as usual for her. Here she comes. Great win. Who actually made the best prediction then? I think well, you, we, you we both you said Bastianelli, didn't we? you should mention that. Both said Bastion. I said there'd be a lone leader, but refused to name it, which you'd all laugh. Orlan Rose, I don't know about you, but I, I listened back to that with a certain sense of nostalgia already. Just, I think I, we, we talk in the car a lot about, you know, who's going to win, you know, just those sort of childish predictions about what might happen. And, you know, already sort of it, it sort of highlighted for me how much I'm going to miss miss bike racing and that excitement and that unpredictability and the unknown and the just the uh, the, the the thrill that it gives us, I suppose, watching these races and and a race like Het News Bad, which is although it's not a, a women's world tour race, amazingly, um, it's it's iconic, isn't it? I mean, you know, the, it, it's a great stage for the women they ride just before the men and there's a real sort of sense of equality i feel at that race in terms of how the teams are presented in the in the in the velodrome in ghent and um you know they're the same start same finish and so on and, and live tv coverage as well this year which was great and, and fantastic crowds out too so it felt like a a big race uh, and an important race and you know, when, it, when it's won by Annemiek van Vluten, that sort of elevates it as well, I think. The crowds looked absolutely incredible. I saw pictures from the presentation and it, it looked immense. And it is such a shame. I mean, I'm missing the bike racing so much already. And I didn't, I weirdly didn't expect to as much as this. I didn't realise how much that unpredictability and... The excitement of racing really just filters through everything. Um, but it is such a shame in the year that this is for women's cycling, the setup that we were looking forward to in terms of the new structure, but mainly the, the, um, television coverage that we were going to get for some of these races for the first time was going to be so exciting. Even just watching Newsblad, like I say, being able to watch it was just phenomenal. And like you say, Richard, the fact that it was Anamik who won it as well just really made it feel like it was an important race that you were getting to watch. And it just wouldn't have had that feeling, I think, if you weren't able to watch it on television. Um, and such a shame that this season of all seasons, with all the hard work that's gone into it and all the campaigning, um, that this is the season that's been interrupted so far. But, you know, it's whetted our appetites beautifully and we'll be desperate for that racing when it comes back again, at least. Also, like the on loop pet news, but it always has a sense of anticipation because it you know it's known as that opening weekend so you know it is quite a big race but it's meant to be kind of a marker for the rest of the season of seeing this ride is going well that ride is going well you know who's going to be the young upstart you know who's going to be the the champion who you know will never loses her uh, place on the throne but so it's kind of yeah it's kind of strange to listen back it seems so hopeful and uh 
uh, and excited and just to think about you know last time we we all um were together when I was saying about going to Strada Bianchi and how exciting that was going to be and you know right up to that race there was kind of this sense of will it happen or will it not happen it's kind of almost unthinkable now when we have this you know kind of drought in front of us that like we I could have even considered going to uh, see Strada Bianchi in the beginning of um, March but yeah but I mean it's it's great to have that you know that slice of uh, racing and to listen to all the what it was like from the team car it's always good to be in a, a race car with Bob Varney as well wherever it is he's a great enthusiast yeah so I was going to say, Rose, it's funny when you when you say about the races and how we usually, the prism through which we usually look at them and something like Newsblad, as you say, is usually seen not even so much as the result in itself. It's more a, a barometer for what's to come. And when I was lo- doing my news roundup, I was looking back to make sure I hadn't missed any races. And there's so much coverage of, of the early season races saying what, you know, opening classics weekend tells us, for example, and everything is projected forward. We almost don't have time usually to sit and just digest a race as it was because we're scrambling to understand what it can mean for the next race and the next race and the bigger races of the season. And it's, it's quite sobering really to look back on the sparsity of the calendar as it is now and to have that time to reflect on everything and to, to see the races as standalone results in their own right, if that makes sense. Because the early season races are now no longer a signifier of anything other than that that rider won that race. And that in itself is quite wonderful. So I feel like there's a stillness to the calendar so far that's almost poetic, but maybe it's just too late at night and, and I'm getting all contemplative. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's what I mean? That's always the case. I, I, I feel in the midst of the season, you're always, there's always a, a narrative that's unfolding mm. over the course of the season and, and you don't um Lionel made this very point actually in the regular podcast this week that Parry Nice was was felt kind of special because everybody knew it was going to be the last race for a while and so it, it kind of mattered in its own right in a way that it mm-hmm. doesn't usually you know it's usually always regarded in the context of the season and also the bigger targets further down the road I guess with this you know with those races the writers didn't know that the season was about to you know, come to a, a, a pause, shall we say? And you know, to think also to to listen back to that day in the car. It was it was very it was a couple of weeks ago, but it feels like a more innocent time. Mm-hmm. That, that there yeah. was a, a sense of there was a sense of crisis uh, unfolding and and happening in Italy at the time. And I think it was the same weekend as the World Track Championships in Berlin, actually. And um, we'll hear in a moment from Martina Alzini she meant she was there you know and went back to this horror in Italy and there was really no sense at all then that that you know coronavirus was going to have the impact that it is now having it's all it all happened very very quickly uh, since then so yeah strange sobering and almost nostalgic to to listen back to these happy days but they will return they will return but i did mention that um i spoke to martina alzini the the italian writer on on bigla katusha and uh, she uh, you know explained at some length what life has been like in lockdown in italy how she's been able to train and live and you know for athletes and riders the the great difficulty is in not really knowing uh, what the future holds, not knowing what you're training for, how you should be training. Uh, so it's a strange, strange time for, for athletes as well. Here she is speaking from her apartment, Martina Alzini. Where are you, Martina? The moment I'm living close to the Velodrome of Monticchiari, because, you know, I, I'm based in Milan, but every time driving until Milan and here, it's more or less two hour by car. So because of the, of the preparation for the Olympic Games, I need to stay close to track. So I decided to move here. And are you still able to ride on the track just now? No, uh, at the moment, the Monte Chiari Velodrome is closed uh, as uh, every kind of uh, public and uh, sportive uh, buildings. For example, all the swimming pool are closed, all the gym are closed, and uh, also our Velodrome is closed now at the mm. moment. And I mean, since Italy went into into lockdown, you've still been able to get out and train on the roads, okay? Yeah, I mean, uh, pro cyclist. We received this email from uh, our association of a pro rider who has uh, who has sent us um, this paper 
that we have to bring every time when we go outside for training. And this paper is something that allowed us to um, training outside that shows that we are pro cyclists. So in the case of the police stop us, we have to show our license and this kind of paper. And d- does that happen quite often? Do you get stopped and, and asked to, to show the certificate? Well, to be honest, since uh, the first day of the quarantine, I was never stopped by the police. But for example, I see lots of control uh, from uh, different kind of police and um, well, lots of control, but mm, luckily no one stopped me. And I, I tell you also, if they stop me, I'm, I'm pretty quiet, quiet, so mm-hmm. I'm not that scared because, um, yeah, I know some cyclists that were stopped, some pro cyclists. But when they explain the situation, they have never trouble with the with the police, so it's fine. I mean, do you train on your own? Or does it affect group rides? You know, can you train with other people? No, or do you train never. on your own? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I uh, especially now while training alone. What I see is that okay, uh, for sure the roads are without cars, so no busy, no traffic. But what I see is also that some people, like amateur were outside for a like i i can say a, le- a like leisure training. ride yeah exactly exactly and uh, these i don't like because um, the laws speak clear uh, speaks clear and uh, they can't go out is not allowed is not permitted go outside if is not for a work reason hmm. or a emergency reason it's sad because i know here with the sun, with the lake, you just want to enjoy your bike, but it's not possible because first we have to think about our country and we have to think about healthy status. You know, the rest of the time when you're not training, I guess you're just you're just inside at home. Yeah, exactly. Uh, fortunately, because we have we have to think positive, we have to stay positive. So I say that fortunately now we that we are trying to prepare at the best the Olympic Games for the track, you know, uh, it's also good preparing that at home. I mean, with rollers, with um, gym, and so we can do some uh, home trainings. If I am not outside with my bike, I'm training at home, uh, you know, with some core stabilities, some exercise, and some um, roller section that for uh, for us, for the track, is good and is part of you of our daily routine. We can say this. And I mean, is it difficult though to to keep motivated, to keep that commitment when there's obviously a lot to worry about? I guess you know you'll have friends, family affected as well, yeah. um, and also the uncertainty of not knowing when when you'll be able to return to racing. How difficult is it to keep the motivation high? It's really difficult and, uh, you know, to be honest, I wake up some morning and I say, oh my God, today maybe I have a hard training and you say, you think, you start to think, oh, why I have to do this, that after there is no races, that after maybe the Olympic Games will be postponed, so why? But, you know, in this really difficult moment, I think that the motivation and the concentration and the focus of your work it's just what we need to carry on. So I try to wake up the morning and say, I have to do this, this and this, because it's part of my work, because it's part of my daily routine and I have to do this to be prepared. In the case of, I don't know, uh, in one month, in two months, we will start again to race. I have to be prepared. So as some of my teammates said on our WhatsApp group, they said, keep on going, girl, and try to think that you know, it's just like winter winter season that you have to prepare. You can train and you can push hard because you know, because you have no races. So in the future, you have to be really prepared. So this is my motivation. And I really, really hope that Tokyo will be or postponed or yes, we, we can do this together. And uh, I think that is a problem of all the federations. Mm. Not only <laughs> cycling, no. but you know, I say this, but I uh, I also want to say that healthy first, and for sure now the problem is concentrating just about our country and healthy of 
people and people who's involved and work for it. And, and is training almost a distraction as well for you from, you know, more serious concerns, more serious things going on? Yeah, it's really difficult. And I say now I really feel this, especially because I'm not living with my parents. I'm not living with my grandparents anymore. I'm living alone here and I'm doing my quarantine here alone. So I wake up in the morning and I know that if I can't go out for with my bike, I completely can't go out. So I try to keep the con- concentration because of this. And I'm thankful that, you know, I can say I'm going out and I'm riding my bike because it's my job and I can do this. I can, I can go out for working. And when I return, I know that I have to stay home. And uh, yeah, it's sad. I can go outside. I can meet my parents, my grandparents. And uh, yeah, I want to also tell you that after the World Championships in uh, Berlin, you know, uh, we were there. And in Germany, we never feel this sensation of emergency. We never feel that there is this really dramatic situation. And also we were in the velodrome doing the World Championship and the velodrome was completely full of people, crowds. And this was just amazing, you know. And then when we were talking about our our families in Italy, they say, oh my God, this is a really bad situation. You go in the supermarket, people is crazy everywhere. They are buying everything because, you know, it's, it's really sad because uh, yeah people is get infected and we say oh my god it's unbelievable we are here and we don't feel nothing <laughs> and you know when i return i just want to make sure for example to don't stay so close to my grandparents mm. because you know maybe say oh i travel i don't know maybe i can i can be involved in this so yeah, I really miss them, but I want to keep them safe. So I say hello. I say, yeah, I miss you, but not so close. Yeah, it's a bit sad, you know? Yeah. And on a practical level, I mean, you mentioned food and supermarkets. Presumably you get out to do food shopping. Is that is that a problem or is, is that been quite, quite easy? Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I mean, as everything is a problem if you go in some specific hour, and uh, it seems <laughs> yesterday when I called my mom, <laughs> she said this, and <laughs> I never forget. She said, it seems Christmas, you know, when mm. every kind of um, food and uh, people is like crazy to buy it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, the situation is dramatic. I mean, uh, um, I live close to a supermarket where if you want to enter, you have to wait for the queue. And uh, in this queue, you have to stay one meter, one meter and a half far from the other people. And uh, you can't enter if you don't have like the mask, how to say the mask for... The face mask, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, gloves and the sanitizer. I really hope that all the people are respecting that things. And uh, because it's the only one thing that can save our, our country, you know. And as are people observing that, you know, as far as you can see, people are obviously taking it very seriously and they're observing all the, 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 the new kind of laws that are in place. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's like what I, what I can notice is that at the beginning, the situation was so unbelievable that people doesn't trust. They say, oh, yeah, we know there is some cases of coronavirus in our country, but I don't care. I know I'm used to go to the bar. I'm used to go at the restaurant. So I am keep doing this. But now they understand that this situation is dramatic. The hospital are full of people, doctors and all the operators, all the people who is working in the hospital are completely, completely full of work. And the system is just at the border, you know, at the borderline. Because, you know, in every hour, every minute on the TV and in every kind of broadcast, people are just saying, please keep safe because otherwise sanitary system, it's full. And I think that now people understood this and in the respect of the work and in the respect of the 
of the really hard work of the doctors, now they are trying to avoid this. It's also a healthy question, but it's also respect for the doctor and for the people who is working for, for the cases. Has there been anything positive about it? I, I, I don't mean um, to, to sort of uh, um, put a, a positive spin on what's a terrible situation, but have you felt anything, you know, in terms of how you've been able to spend the time, maybe not traveling so much, maybe, you know, training on quieter roads, maybe a, a, a period of reflection and a period of, of, of having conversations with families that, that you, that with your family that you maybe don't have ordinarily. I mean, has there been anything positive at all in this, in this period? Yes, I think that in every kind of situation, also in the most dramatic situation, we have to think positive and try to take the positive side of the things, you know? And um, what I can say is that, for example, if I'm talking to my friends, normal friends i'm not talking about cycling i'm talking about you know people that is used to work or to study at the university that now is at home now they have a really good opportunity to spend some time with the family to doing something that they have never done i know lots of people who now they are trying <laughs> to cook something specific or i don't know uh, discover different hobby this is fine i think that this is the good side of stay at home and there are lots of videos that uh, you can find in Instagram or Facebook about people who from uh, their balcony are are singing are playing music because you know some some days here we have in a specific hour I don't know like like last last week at Friday at 6 People uh, was just out of the balcony for uh, for singing our national. Uh, we say inno. Yeah, the national <laughs> anthem. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. You know, it was a bit emotional, and uh, it, <laughs> you can't imagine. I was almost crying for this because it's some situation that for us is just unbelievable, unreal, and it's something that make us more more close also mm-hmm. if we are living far if we are living isolate it's something that unify us also if i think about lots of people that are donate the money and lots of sportive people that are together stronger for building something that can really help our society this it, it's make me not crying but it's something that you never see every day and when you see you understand that humans sometimes can build something that it's really strong and helpful. And this is good. I just want to say the last thing that, yeah, uh, for sure, I'm thankful about all the people that are trying to help our our country. But I also want that all the other countries like Italy take this kind of safety model take really serious consideration about the coronavirus because it's really dangerous and uh, they say yeah uh, in Italy we have lots of cases of this but Italy was one of the first country in Europe that take really serious and several healthy measurement how to say like mm. yeah that all the other countries think about that Chute, chute à l'arrière du peloton, Cycling Podcast Team Car, the back of the pack, please. This month's episode of the Cycling Podcast Femina is supported by LACA. LACA is a community of cyclists all working together to ensure their bikes and equipment in the event of damage or loss. Ensuring the premiums are lower and the payouts in the event of a claim are swifter, you'll be dealing with people who understand bikes, who will know their Shimano from their SRAM, and that racing bikes and equipment can be expensive. Your premium depends, of course, on the value of your bikes and equipment, and it goes up or down depending on how many other claims there are, though there is a ceiling. But don't take our word for it. Let's hear from a LACA customer. My name is Luis. I'm a keen cyclist. I'm 46 years old. I ride around uh, 300 kilometers a week. I became a LACA customer, I think, last year, a year and a half. I had actually two claims in one year. Uh, I crashed last year, broke my collarbone, um, the bike, uh, some parts, they were damaged, which I claim with the LACA, and they were 
excellent. I, I have no one, no other word to, to describe that customer service and how they deal with the situation. I had everything fixed. I had a reply in two days. It was all sorted. So um, I just um, did a little video, which I uploaded to the website, uh, along with my claim, describing what happened. And I had a reply, I, I believe, next morning very early morning, uh, saying, yes, we're going to replace your helmet. Um, if you can, the amount, um, I mean, how much will be for to fix the bike, which I, I, I had the shop to contact them. Um, and they sorted out everything for me. I'm very, very satisfied customer. And I advise anyone who can hear this, uh, Laka, it's um, amazing. If that sounds like the sort of insurance you'd like for your bikes and equipment, go to laka.co.uk. That's laka, L-A-K-A, dot co, dot UK. The cycling podcast Femina is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for their continued support of the cycling podcast Femina. You can get 25% off your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25. That's SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. I can see you both smiling there, but I'm not going to permit any singing this month because the the delays on our respective connections are just going to make that even more of a horror show than it usually is. <laughs> There's no no winners, is so, there? There's no winners. Yeah. No, nah, no, nah, definitely not. Um, well, we heard before the break there from uh, Martina Alzini, the Italian rider. We wish her and every other rider and everybody else affected um, by coronavirus and the lockdown the best of luck and uh, hope that you know some certainty um appears soon and i think we're all looking to italy aren't we for cause they've, they've, that, that's the country in europe that was affected first and, and most seriously at the moment and you look for some signs that it's going to end there and and that will give us all a sense of how it's a long canary in the coal mine there isn't it yeah give us all a sense of how long this this may last so strange and and uh, you know martina there talked about some of the the positive things that have come out of it in the situation that she and others are in so you know that was uh, nice to hear as well but obviously it's a dreadful situation just a couple of odds and sods i hope they don't mind me <laughs> describing them as that from Het news <laughs> which one's odd and which one's sod <laughs> yeah i don't know um but yeah i mean mm-hmm. i spoke to we didn't mention lizzie banks our um well part of the cycling podcast family isn't she Lizzie mm. because she our sister our yeah, cycling podcast sister she presents a service course our equipment and tech podcast with Tom Wally that's a monthly podcast as well it does a great job on that uh, but she's also quite a handy bike rider and uh, she rode really well at Het Newsblad she was in that chasing group which was you know a very strong chasing group and finished sixth in the race and for her that was a she, okay she won a stage the, the Giro last year she rode very well at the women's tour but I felt that was a bit of a breakthrough performance from her. Um, not just the result, but the performance. She was very aggressive and really not afraid at all to stick her nose in the wind and have a real go and take it to these riders. So I spoke to her at the finish and I was quite impressed by just how sort of gung-ho she was and uh, not daunted at all by some of the company she was keeping. That was that was quite a day you had out there. Sixth, happy with that? Yeah, it was a war from start to finish. On the start line, there were so many people dressed in like short, short, you know, short, short shorts and short arms. And I just thought you, you're you bloody stupid because we knew that the rain was going to come. We knew it was going to get cold. It was about energy as possible, staying as warm as possible. I was missing a tiny bit today. I uh, I had a crash in Valencia on the first day and I smashed up my knee. So I was like, I spent three days this week resting. So I think I was just lacking a little bit of sharpness, but I, uh, I killed myself to make that group over the couple more and uh and just over the top of the bosberg i just couldn't couldn't quite react so yeah i uh i was killing myself to to try and stay ahead and uh when i thought it was 3k to go it was actually 6k to go because uh they told us the wrong distance but no all in it all i'm uh i'm pretty happy um we have a really strong team here today some of the girls had some misfortune but it's a really good showing of what's to come over the next few months and over the spring and i think that our team, Big Likatusha, I think we have so many strong riders who really care about each other and really care about working together that we can get some really good results and 
results that speak volumes for the size of the team that we are. You, I mean, you were you said you were quite nervous at, at the start. I think that's probably about clothing choices as much as anything, because it did look a bit uncertain then. But when you, you know, at the sharp end of the race, when you find yourself in that group, in that company that you were in, you must have looked around and been pretty happy to, to find yourself there. Yeah, but it's about believing that you're just as good as those people. You can't look around and be and think they're world class and I'm not. You have to think I can do this just as much as they can. Okay, yeah, I did get gapped over the Bosberg, so I need to I need to be smarter. Maybe that's something I need to work on. But um, if you let it get inside your head and you let them think that they're bigger than you, then you're not going to have a chance. So uh, clearly, you're not intimidated at all. No, I, I don't think we have any reason to be. Like we showed in Valencia that we've got a really strong team, and uh, yeah, I mean we're here we mean business like we're just as good as them yeah maybe we don't have a big bus maybe we don't have hundreds of millions of dollars to spend on loads of shit but like we're strong we work hard we deserve to be here too so that was lizzie banks of big la katusha and i also spoke to rolf aldag who is making his debut in women's cycling with canyon shram a sports director Met for many years, of course, with HTC High Road, Quick Step, and uh, Dimension Data, and he's switched over to the women's sport and and is really learning um, in the in the seat at the Canyon SRAM team. So I spoke to him at the finish ahead news blood. How are you finding your your new role? How was it today? A familiar race for you, but uh, I guess a different type of race. Well, the the biggest problem actually was uh, being car twenty three. So we really had bad luck uh, in picking the cars, and you really have no sense and rhythm for. Um, for what goes on in the race so it's really uh, you can just give technical advice but tactically wise it's super difficult um, I think the girls did do really well being with two in the 21st and then was epic was cold was windy and then it just didn't didn't last to the finish line but uh, that was quite all right but it's super active the race if you see it you know it's always on 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 it keeps on going it's shorter um, so you have to be awake from from kilometer zero as well and uh, was a, definitely interesting. Looking forward to do some more. Yeah, are you enjoying? Are you enjoying the, the role? I know you were in the training camp and riding a bit with the, the girls as well. But are you enjoying um, getting under the skin of, of what's? I think you said it was like a new sport almost. Yeah, yeah, it's a complete different thing. Uh, you know, it is complicated. I'm, I'm really thankful for also like you know for getting this opportunity to learn this new uh, this new uh, you know side of cycling of course it's still cycling it's still professional road cycling uh, but the strategies are different the strengths of teams are different so it's a learning process and uh, you know so you know I try to bring up some new things like uh, you know presentations to them giving them a lot of tactical information so they know what they can expect but then I really really need their help on uh, you know how the race unfolds and everything it's the riders it's it's Ronnie himself so uh, so it's definitely super interesting it's you know like a little child like you know discovering new things so that was Rolf Aldag baptism of fire for him they were unlucky it's a it's a completely random draw at that race for the order of the team cars I think they were just about last team car so didn't really see an awful lot of action that day another thing that caught my eye there was service Canavan's new uh, women's team was riding they had a big old bus and everything quite an impressive setup NXTG Racing and his daughter Britt Canavan is one of their riders. She's 19. He's got four daughters, doesn't he? And I think um, at least a few of them are racing cyclists. Anything more from this month, ladies? Well, I was actually going to just say about um, Savas's team. He's had a, a team for a few years now and he's kind of just followed up the ranks with his daughter Britt. So while he was, she was a junior, it was a junior team. And... Um, It'll be, it will be quite a baptism of fire because when they're at these junior races, I went in the race car uh, for their team at Ghent Feverham Juniors and um, they would rock up. Everyone else would just, you know, not even have practically enough fold up chairs that they could sit on and they would rock up and they would have a big van. They'd get all the Pinarello dogmas off the, off the roof rack. And um, so I think it would be quite a surprise for them going from dictating the racing to coming in and being in the being against the big guns yeah they they, they've certainly get a bit of help from uh, the team sky and now team Ineos sponsors as well um well listen we should wrap things up for this month we'll be back for the april episode of the second podcast femina i know orla you've got a really fascinating interview set up for that we'll have lots more as well and lots will be uh lots will be going on we will hope maybe maybe we'll have an idea of when 
of, or a vague idea of when racing might return as well. Who knows? Who knows? But we'll have plenty I'm of sure. stories. You're asking too much of us now, Richard. Well, there's plenty knows. of stories to get your listening you. chops around, though. That's for sure. It's going to be a meaty old episode. I don't expect, <laughs> yes. I don't expect you to know. <laughs> anyway, that's all for this one. Thanks, Rose. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Thanks, all. Thanks, Thank Orla. you both. Good luck. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Thank you.